John, I'm putting you on alert. I'm going to ask you to mute my microphone in just a few minutes, but not right now, okay? I just want you to be alerted to that. First thing that I want to do this morning is I want to have a huddle. And I'm going to call some people that need to be involved in this huddle uh, to come up on stage. You don't have to do anything. You just have to huddle with me, okay? So I'm going to have a huddle. Nikkei, I need you. Jeffrey, I need you this huddle. Teresa, I need you in this huddle. Crenshaw, I need you in this huddle. Just come huddle up. Mute my microphone. Oh, you can go, you can go, yeah. <clears throat> I told them a secret, okay? And how long do you think it would take that secret to get to everybody in the world? Now remember, these are some pretty big mouths. Okay, these are, Crenshaw, Crenshaw knows it, everybody will know it by next week. How long do you think it would take for that secret to get around the world? A week? Ten days? Two thousand years? Today we're actually talking about Jesus looking into the future. <clears throat> and he says some things to his disciples, but he's only talking to that small group. And part of what they're going to experience and what they're being told is going to happen fairly quickly. Some of what Jesus makes reference to is going to happen right away. But in some other places, he gives us some indication that this is also some principles about some things that are going to come way out in the future. We've been 2,000 plus years telling the story of Jesus. Is there going to be an end to that? And I'm going to say, I'm going to answer that by saying yes. <clears throat> One of my favorite plays that I love to go see around Christmas time, Sanders Family Christmas. If you've never met the Sanders family, they are a who. They're from the mountains of North Carolina. They play, the binge, they play the banjo, they play guitars, they play the big bass, and they just love to go to them old country churches in North Carolina, and they just sing about Jesus, and especially at Christmas time. But at this particular time, the play is set in the early 1940s, Pearl Harbor has been bombed, and there's a young man that sings in the group, and he's probably 18 years old. At the most, 18 years old. He may even be a little bit younger, but he is enlisted in the military because there's a war, and he wants to defend his country, and he feels the need uh, to be used. And so he enlists, and this is his last Christmas concert before he goes to boot camp. And as part of the Christmas concert, they've, they've sung some beautiful Christmas carols, and people have joined in. And at some point, they ask this young boy, to share his testimony. Not unusual in Little Mountain Churches in North Carolina for people to share their testimony. And he begins by sharing his testimony by talking about, in case you haven't heard, I've enlisted in the military. And he gives his patriotic reason for doing that. He says, I feel a need to, to be patriotic. Our country is calling for volunteers. And so I went down and signed up. And you can see his mama going, you know how mamas do. And he began to say, in next week or so, I'm going to be shipped off to boot camp. <clears throat> and I really don't know where I'm going to end up. And then he said this, which is the line that I want you to capture today. He says, there was a, there was a time when Jesus came to the earth and he knew exactly when he was going to die and how he was going to die. He knew exactly when he was going to die and how he was going to die. <clears throat> and they said, I'm really glad that I don't have that knowledge. Would you like to have that knowledge? You know, the knowledge to know when exactly, maybe even day, maybe even the hour. You know, the only people that I think really knows that are maybe some people that are on death row that have been, have run out of all their appeals and they know Friday is the date. But there are very few of us that really know exactly when we're going to die. And none of us really know how we're going to die. I mean, that's still kind of up for question, is it not? 
You know, I assume that, that I may die with Alzheimer's. I don't know that. My mom and dad did. And so I may take that assumption and apply it to my life. And if I'm not careful, I will think every time I forget somebody's name, it's starting. Have you ever done that? I did it this morning. I couldn't recall Jeffrey's name. I know Jeffrey. I know Jeffrey well enough that I should have known his name. But I had one of those senior moments, and I said to myself, it's starting. I should know that name. But I didn't feel too bad because I asked Abner, I said, what's that guy's name? He said, I don't, I, well, he had to think about it too. And I thought to myself, you're too young to have Alzheimer's. Everybody, this is Jeffrey. After the service, will everybody come say hello to Jeffrey and just say the name a lot so all of us will get used to it? But you know what I'm talking about. People who have grandparents and parents that die of heart disease, every time they have a chest pain, they automatically think, am I having that heart attack? Jesus does not tell us exact dates, exact hows. He tells us broad principles. And those broad principles should be a guiding factor. The very fact today that we're observing the communion, we're observing the Lord's Supper, says to us three things. One, Jesus came. He broke his body. His blood was shed. We will talk about that. <clears throat> we talk about him being present in our lives. He gathers with us around the table. But he also said to his disciples, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine until we do it again in eternity. So today we're actually making a proclamation of that which is yet to come. All right, now turn with me to Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke chapter 21, and we're going to begin reading with verse 10. <clears throat> I'm going to give a little bit of commentary as we read, and then we're going to come back and begin to take a look at the passage in great detail. He then continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes and in various places plagues and famines. And there will be terrors and great signs of heaven. Now, there are two places that Jesus makes these similar statements. In Luke, Luke is further developed than Matthew. All right, But Matthew chapter 24 gives a more detailed explanation of this discourse. Luke only emphasizes two questions. We'll talk about that in just a few moments. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. All right? That doesn't look like a great future, does it? And I will lead, and it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. <clears throat> For I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. Yet not a hair of your head will perish. But your endurance, you will, by your endurance, you will gain your lives. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that the desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are days of vengeance, <clears throat> so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to his people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. <coughs> now, if you have your Bible and want to switch to it, if you go over to Matthew chapter 24, there's a little more detail given. And I want us to, to hear that little bit of detail and then put this in its context. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is standing in front of the temple. They have, they, now remember in Luke, he's gone to the temple. He's driven out the, he said, a den of thieves. He's driven out the robbers from the temple. He's cleansed the temple. He's been teaching in the temple. And the, the, the disciples 
are mesmerized by the temple. Have you ever been to a really, 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 really fancy cathedral type church? Have you ever been to a church that is so unique that, you, that you're just taken back by that church? One of my favorite places, one of my favorite stories is I got to preach one Sunday morning at the First Baptist Church in Sumter, South Carolina. My friend Kirk Smith was the, was the pastor of that church. He was going to be out of town. And he called and said, Steve, is there any way possible that you can preach at First Baptist Church Sumter on this particular Sunday while I'm gone? And, and I knew that they had just built a brand new sanctuary. State of the art, cutting edge, really neat sanctuary. Kurt had been ser- several years trying to get them to tear down their old sanctuary and to build a new one. And finally, a tornado came through and did that work for them. The, the old building was destroyed and they had to build a new sanctuary, a new worship center. And when I drove up, I went, whoa, wow. Kind of like people do when they drive up to First Baptist Woodstock for the very first time. They kind of go, wow. And when I went in, they had marble floors. I could hear myself walk, and I had tennis shoes on. Click, 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 click. It was just a sound efficient. The, the guy that was showing me around, that was hosting me, said, let me show you our stained glass windows. They're inlaid with gold. And I went, wow. The building I was in, they had prefab stained glass windows that we bought from some third cut rate place, and they just stuck them in there. But these were inlaid with gold. And then he said, which pulpit (coughs) would you like to speak from this morning? I'd never been where they had more than one. But they had one that was kind of like the old Charleston design. You had to go upstairs and you went into a, and into a little booth kind of thing and had a sounding board over the top of it. And I would probably have been 10 to 15 feet above everybody in the sanctuary. Dr. Smith preaches from there on Sunday morning. Well, I said, I'm not Dr. Smith. I can't do that. I'm not, I don't want to do that one. Then they had a pulpit down on the main stage. And it was just monstrous, but it was so far away from the people. I, I said, well, what's my third choice? And they had a little podium that sat down on the floor. I said, that's me. Let, me. let me do that. And then the guy said, now, when the choir sings, after the choir does our call to worship, we're going to ask you to do our opening prayer this morning. And I looked around. There was no choir. I could not find the choir anywhere. I thought they might have been up in the balcony. I thought that maybe the choir would enter. But the organ, the pipe organ began to play, and all of a sudden, the choir began to rise up out of the floor. You know what I did, Jim? I went, wow. I'd never seen such as that. And I mean, it was a big choir. It probably had 80 voices in it, and they had a lift, and that came right up out of the floor. And I went, Wow. And I began my prayer by saying, Dear Lord, I don't know why in the world I'm here this morning. I'm as out of place as I can be. Those disciples entering into the temple were going, Wow. Wow. Look at this. Look how big it is. Look how beautiful it is. Look at those lumbers that came from the trees in Lebanon. Look at the gold and all the implements that were of the time of David. Look at all this. Wow, what a big building. And in Matthew, Jesus looked them in the eye and said, not one stone will be left upon the other. Wouldn't it have been kind of wild if I'd have started my sermon at First Baptist Church Sumter and said, wow, this is a really neat place, but it's all going to be leveled someday. It's all going to be destroyed. What if I were to say to you, this place that we worship in that we all love will one day be no more. 
Structures mean nothing. And Jesus turns around and says to his disciples, you're focused on the wrong thing. Let me give you a glimpse of the future. Not one stone of this building will rest upon the other. There's coming a time when it's going to be totally level. Now, in Matthew's gospel, <coughs> Jesus has asked three questions by his disciples. The first question is, when will these things happen? When will the destruction of this temple take place? The second question they ask is, when will the end of time come? When will the end be? Because they're thinking that the only way <coughs> that the temple could be destroyed would be at the very end when everything is destroyed. And the third question they ask is, give us a sign of your coming. Jesus had been telling them, three days, I'll be gone, but I will come again. I will be back. And so they've heard that, and they begin to say to him, give me some indication of what we can look for about you coming back. Luke, on the other hand, only narrows it down to two questions. The questions are, when is this going to happen? When's the destruction of the temple going to happen? And second, give us a sign. Tell us what we can look for when that comes. So I want us to deal with Luke today, even though when we're looking into our future, a lot of these principles will still be the same. The first question is, when's this going to happen? And Jesus doesn't give them a specific answer. <clears throat> he says, when you see the armies gathering around, get ready. Okay? In the mind of Jewish people, the temple could never, ever, ever, ever be destroyed, even though it had already been destroyed once in history. They anticipated that God lived there, God sat there, and that there was nothing on the planet that could rise up against God. They felt pretty secure that God could defend his own house. They felt pretty sure, they felt pretty sure that God would never, ever, ever let this monstrous building of the temple be destroyed. So they were pretty confident. And, but they're asking Jesus, when? <coughs> and Jesus said to them, when you see the armies gathering, the desolation is near. He uses a term in, in Matthew, he calls it the, desol the abomination of desolation. And back before the temple was, um, was reestablished, there were some soldiers that actually went into the temple and offered a pig on the sacrificial altar. And they called it a desolation of abomination. It was an abominable act. And Jesus said, something like that is going to happen. When you see the Roman soldiers gathering around the walls, get out of town. For those of you that are pregnant and nursing babies, this is not going to be an easy time. You're going to have to flee immediately. We know from history that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Luke probably was written after that time. But Luke is keeping it in its historical context. We think that Matthew may have been written a little bit before 70 AD because he never makes mention that this prophetic thing happened. But we know that it did. It has already occurred. Jesus gave them a glimpse of something very near to them that was going to happen, and it happened. In Matthew, he answers the other two questions. I'm going to give you an indication of what it's like when the end will come, and I want to give you some things to look for when I'll return. There are three things that can be grouped together in both those passages <clears throat> of what to look for. The first thing that I think we need to look for is imposters. In both places, it says that there will be people come who claim to be me. There will be people who will claim to know me. There will be people who will claim to know the gospel, but they are imposters. Be careful if someone says to you, hey, come over and take a look. Jesus has come. Jesus is over here, or Jesus is back here, or Jesus is going to be visiting our church Sunday morning. Come and gather and see that. And Jesus turned around and said, there will be a day when the truth will be adulterated. There will be a day when that which is real will be covered up by that which is not real. Folks, we, we kind of be, we're kind of seeing a little bit of that, are we not? There has never been a time in history, particularly in the United States, where where the normal, everyday person so questions the church. They're no longer seen as reliable or even accountable. They're now seen as those people that tell one thing, but do something else. And that many have portrayed themselves 
as being the truth, but are not. The second thing he says is watch out for conflict. There's going to be nation rising up against nation, but he even gets more detailed than that. Families will begin to have difficult times. Even before the destruction of the temple, there were imposters rising up. Even before the destruction of the temple, there were families that were being ripped apart by the gospel because some believed and others did not. Others were turning other people into the Roman soldiers because they were trying to get rid of it so quickly. <clears throat> and all but one of the disciples died unnatural deaths. Only John lived to have old age. And the third thing he says is pretty interesting. He says there will be all kinds of disasters. There will be some earthquakes. There will be all kinds of things that will just be out of the abnormal for us. Now, here's what I want to say to you. Those are not signs that the end is near. What Jesus says in Matthew is very clear. He says that is the beginning of the birth pains. He kind of uses a, a labor term. When a woman goes into labor, there's pain that begins the process, but it's not the ending result. There's going to be this process that's going to happen, and this is going to be a natural cause of that process. I believe that John, in the book of Revelation, says to us <clears throat> that history repeats itself, but it's cyclic in nature. And I want you to understand this, because we're going to make a point in just a moment that's, that's kind of essential. History sometimes is seen as beginning and end, creation and end. And that's one way to look at history. Another way to look at history is that it constantly repeats itself. It's all about deja vu. It has a beginning point, and it just repeats itself, and it repeats itself, and it repeats itself. <coughs> John, in the book of Revelation, gives us the indication that history begins, but it goes cyclic in nature. It repeats itself, but as it's doing so, it's progressing into the future. And that each of these cycles becomes more intense than the cycle before it. So John begins to say things like this. Yeah, there were earthquakes back then, but there's also going to be earthquakes here, and they're going to be more intense, maybe more in number. Yeah, you had wars back here, but the wars are going to get more intense as the future goes on. We can see that. When Luke writes his gospel and John writes his gospel, they fought with swords and shields and spears and chariots. No one in that day could have ever imagined nuclear weapons or weaponry that was so mobilized that it could destroy towns in hours, if not days. No one could imagine large sums of people coming to the end of their lives at one time, as we can say today. Uh, there's a doomsday clock. Did you read this week that the doomsday clock has been moved forward? When the doomsday clock was first set up, it was set up for 90 seconds. 90 seconds was the doomsday, and sometimes they've moved it further back to like five minutes. When the world's at peace, when things seem to be okay, they can't really see a whole lot of threats going on. They have moved the, calendar, they have moved the doomsday clock as back as many as five to five minutes before midnight. Midnight being destruction. Do you know where it's sitting right now? 15 seconds. They felt the need to move it closer. 15 seconds. Well, 15 seconds could be years. I'm not trying to threaten you and say 15 seconds, we're all going to go. But what I'm saying to you, people who look at our world situation see it as intense, very difficult very conflictual and that destroying the earth 11 times over if we have weaponry that can do that seems more like a reality today than it was yesterday that's what Jesus was giving us insight into he said when you look into the future there's some things that I want you to watch out for first of all I want you to watch out for the deterioration of the truth that there will be truth that will, be, that will be covered up by falsehoods. Be cautious of that. First and foremost, I want to say to you today, as we proceed in the future, we must hold on to the truth. We must find what the truth of the gospel is and not adulterate that. 
Second, watch out for those in conflictual situations. <clears throat> Not just the world in conflict, but the conflict that begins to rise within a person's own family life. And watch for the disasters. They will come and they will go. In Matthew, he ends that statement about the disasters by saying this. But when the gospel is preached to the whole world, then the end will come. Jesus gives us one indicator of when the end will come. Now, I happen to be one of those people that believe, people that, believe that when Jesus returns, that's also the end. The, they're, they're not two separate events. Some separate that into two events. I see them as one. That when Jesus returns, the end of the earth as we know it <coughs> will happen. And that will happen when the gospel is proclaimed to the whole earth. Courtney, what secret did you learn this morning? In the huddle. Huh? You didn't make it up there? McKay, what secret did you learn this morning? Huh? Shh, shh, shh. Everybody in here has got to hear you. I don't think it's loud enough yet. Mm. Jeffrey, can you do any better than that? That's pretty good. Teresa, I know you've got a big mouth. Can you do a little bit better than this? Ah! You're a purist. Imposters! I did say that, didn't I? I am coming again. Now, I, I use that illustration to say to this. Sometimes what gets adulterated is not intentional. It gets passed, it gets passed, it gets passed, it gets passed, it gets passed. And eventually there's some added and some taken away. But it's important that we remember what Jesus said to his disciples. He said two things that are essential to us. When the gospel is preached to the whole earth, then I'll return. The end will come. And the second thing that he says to us is, I don't know when that is. I can tell you when the temple is going to be destroyed in various terms. When you see Rome, Rome's going to gather up and they're going to destroy Jerusalem. When you see that happening, rest assured, the temple will be destroyed. That's as sure as I can nail it down. But when his disciples said, tell us when you're going to come again, he says this to them, I don't no. I thought Jesus knew everything. I don't know. Only my Father in heaven knows. And when he says go, I will go. When we look into our futures, when we look into what is in our future as the Christian church, there are some basic principles. Basic principle is this. There are some things that Jesus said would happen that have already happened. <clears throat> there are some things that the prophets said that have already happened. And we can look back and know that that's taken place. There is this concept that's universal that we should guard against being deceived. Or being misled. And I'm afraid that there are a lot of folks out there that have kind of come to the conclusion that they know how it's going to happen. And even some can kind of predict. I've even heard dates since I've been here. Do you know that there have been two dates of the end of time predicted since I've been the pastor at North River Baptist Church? I never preached on either one of those subjects. I never joined in because I said that person doesn't know what they're talking about. One of them was October something. I can't remember the exact thing. October had a specific date and even a specific time. And those people gathered in their church waiting for the end to come. I'd hate to be the pastor to explain, well, that was wrong. That's not what being deceived is. Being deceived is when we come to the place where we don't believe the truth anymore. Where the truth is no longer a part of us. And we've been led away from the guiding principle that Jesus said, I will return. 
And the thing that matters most is our patient endurance. There are four things in my theology that I cannot compromise and will not compromise. We can debate scripture and we may have opinions on scripture and I may be right and you may be wrong or you may be wrong and I may be right. Didn't catch that, only a few did. Yeah. I may be wrong. I may interpret scripture wrong. I may look at a passage and, and be totally off. That doesn't make me a false teacher. That just says that my knowledge is limited in that particular area, maybe. But there are four things that cannot be compromised. And I want you to know those as we gather for communion this morning. Principle number one that I cannot compromise, Jesus came. There is no doubt in my mind that Jesus came as the Messiah. That the one who identified himself as Jesus, the one whom Mary and Joseph laid in a manger in a stable in Bethlehem was the Messiah. I cannot compromise that. I cannot compromise that he died and was buried. I cannot compromise that. I know that he died because everybody dies. But I believe that he died as a sacrifice before God. That he became the sacrificial lamb. And we talk about the lamb at the Passover meal. That Jesus said the lamb that has been offered year after year after year after year is now going to be narrowed down to one. And I'm the one. I believe that when Jesus died, that he became our sacrifice. I believe he was buried. And the third point is, I believe that he rose again. I do not believe that his bodily resurrection is an indicator that all of our bodies will be resurrected someday. I believe his resurrection was definitely connected to the role of the high priest and that he was saying to us, the sacrificial lamb has been accepted. And therefore, he whispered in his disciples' ears, go tell everybody this story. And they began to move into the world. But the last thing that I cannot compromise is yet future. I believe that Jesus came. I believe that Jesus died. I believe that Jesus was buried and rose again. Those are all things that happened. But I also believe he's coming again. The angel said to the disciples when he ascended back into heaven, why stand ye here looking up amazed? The same Jesus in like manner will return. And I believe that to be true. I believe that we will all come to an end someday. Some of us will come to an end because of our natural deaths. Some of us will come to an end because we walked out in front of a bus and got hit. Some of us will come to an end because we did something foolish, like get drunk and drive a car and hit a telephone pole on the side of the road. All of those indicate an ending of life. But I believe that one day when Jesus returns, life as we know it ends. And I also believe in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we all will be changed. Whatever that means. I don't know what it means. It means that I'm leaving this realm and I'm entering this realm. That's all that really matters. And I believe that someday, just as we gather around this table today, we will gather around the tables of heaven and we will drink the fruit of the vine. And we will dip the bread. No longer will we be celebrating what Jesus did, but we will be celebrating we've entered our eternities. As we pray, I'm going to ask the deacons to come and we'll share our communion today. Dear Father, we're thankful for your goodness and grace. We're thankful for giving us some indication that there's a tomorrow. For many of us, we struggle in the muck trying to figure out what's going to happen today, tomorrow, the next day. We don't need to be concerned about that. What we need to be concerned about is that you have it all in hand and we simply just endure and trust. And I believe that one day you'll come. 
And when you come, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess and every nation will be drawn unto you. That's not combative. That's not militant. That's not something I beat people over the heads with. It's just my hope. It's the future that I believe is coming. So as we gather around this table today, let us be reminded of that. For we pray it in Christ's name and for his sake.